This is going to be a little bit of a directional switch. We're going to be a lot more subdiaphragmatic in this next part, I can assure you. So um, I'm going to turn it over, though, to Tina, who I think is going to introduce us to this next half of our morning. And it's sure to be a delight as we discuss this year's Lifetime Achievement Award. So Tina, take it away. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. Thanks very much, Chris. And Steve, that's a really hard act to follow. <laughs> Happily so. Yeah. Uh, so good morning, everyone. I'm Tina Stromstead. I'll be reading from this because there's so much to say, and I don't want to take up more time than I will already. Um, so I'm going to stay a little bit on task and hooked up with the images. So I have the very great pleasure to introduce my longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Judith Weaver, recipient of this year's Lifetime Achievement Award. My hope is that by the end of my introduction, those who don't know her will have a greater sense of the impact and influence she has on people in many parts of the world. And those who do know her can celebrate. I understand that when Judith received the call about this award, it reminded me a little bit of what you were saying, Steve. She paused and said, why? <laughs> so I'm going to take a little bit of time to give you some background, which she would never give you. <laughs> I first met Judith when we were both core faculty in the somatic psychology program at the California Institute of Integral Studies, where she had previously been chair of the East-West Psychology Department. And I want to say it's so heartwarming to see a number of graduates, students, and faculty connected to that program here today, represented in the group, as well as people from many parts of the world, many parts of the country and the world. When I first met her, I was taken by her deep and quiet presence, her wisdom, and her experience in multiple interdisciplinary areas of the field. She was passionate in nature, advocating for our students, and for underrepresented people in different parts of the world who greatly needed support. We hit it off immediately, sharing values in body, psyche, soul healing, honoring the sacred feminine and masculine, our love of dance, cross-cultural work, nature, adventure, and more. Later, when Judith co-founded the Somatics Doctoral Program at Santa Barbara Graduate Institute with Marty Glenn. More about this later. She invited me to offer courses there. It's also wonderful to see people here from SBGI, graduates and faculty. So, and now some of us are here at Pacifica, carrying on the tradition in the depth psychology with a somatic specialization. Ray, where are you? There you are, okay. <laughs> and Christine Caldwell, you know, we have many people from there who are on the faculty. So it's a long tradition, as, which also exists in other parts of the world, and you're kind of here in our home base. More personally, Judith and I shared a cabin in Bolinas, California, by the sea for 20 years, rotating weekends with a few other colleagues so we could afford it. We celebrated Thanksgivings there and took quiet time for meditation, walking, writing, and ritual gatherings. Deer routinely peered through the windows there at dawn. Hummingbirds zipped around from the lupins to the hollyhocks. Pelicans soared, and a small red fox often came to visit. These are among the vivid moments with Judith that I hold close to my heart. Let's rewind in time to go back to the 1940s. During this time, we see the development of a curious and talented young Judith as she developed her passion and love for dance and the arts. Here she is at two years old in her little tutu already demonstrating a deep-rooted love of movement. Judith once told me that her mother was a dancer 
who had toe shoes with taps on them. <laughs> Judith still has them. I don't know if you're using them or not, but oh, okay. <laughs> it didn't come as a surprise that dancing is in your blood. Tragically, her mother died following the birth of Judith's younger sister soon after this picture was taken. We all have our origins in this work. This profound early loss and other childhood experiences likely laid some of the groundwork for Judith's devotion to pre- and perinatal psychology and development. Deep sensing, Reichian energy work, natural movement, and ongoing meditation on the meaning of life and the dance of movement and stillness. This is her performing Kabuki, The Lion Dance, in 1965. At 26, Judith embarked on a life-changing journey to Japan, immersing herself in the culture, learning the dances, philosophies, and spiritual traditions. For Judith, Western religions and philosophies did not quite satisfy the question she had. In an interview with Nancy Eckhorn for the International Body Psychotherapy Journal, and I believe that's available, Judith said, when I studied Taoism and Buddhism, it gave me no answers, but told me that since I was here, to do the best I could. That I could understand and accept. Here's another picture of her performing a kabuki dance and practicing dance with her teacher in Japan in 1966. Yeah. Here she is performing a no dance that same year. Very different. In 1967, Judith became the only woman Buddhist monk at Shofuku-ji Rinzai Zen Monastery under Zen Grandmaster Yamada Muman Roshi in Kobe, Japan. Here you can see her in traditional robes. Judith had a spiritual longing and a profound interest in pursuing life's mysteries that allowed her to venture into what had traditionally been male-dominated spheres. Looking back on those days, Judith said, I was so passionate about wanting to stay there and study that I forgot at that point that I was Caucasian and that I was a woman. This was a traditional Japanese male enclave. Grace, an enlightened teacher, allowed me to stay. Here she is in 1968, meditating under the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya, India. A second picture of her under the Bodhi tree at the temple there. Years later, Judith returned to Japan to visit her teacher in the monastery. Here she is with the Grand Master Yamada Muman Roshi. This time, she brought her two children, Tara, who is 10 in this picture, and David, who's seven. And another picture a few years later, returning once again with her kids. Great kids, by the way. In 1968, Judith returned to the United States, where she worked for Esalen Institute, married Ben Weaver, and had two children. That same year, she met Charlotte Selver, who introduced her to sensory awareness. Charlotte was convinced that the well-being of the individual, the society as a whole, and even the worries about our environment depend on how far we find new confidence in organic processes. This was a pivotal moment as Charlotte Selver's work and mentorship in experience through the senses, the conscious sensing of the body, and the following of physical sensations 
what Charlotte came to call sensory awareness, something I think we all do in this field, so we owe a great debt, really. These principles and practices enrich Judith's understanding of the connection between mind, body, spirit, nature, and community. In sensory awareness, she found a deep practice that complemented the experiences she'd been studying in Buddhism in Japan. Her worlds were coming together in a way that engaged her spiritual longing, her sense of vitality, and her wish to support others in their healing and development. Here is a later picture of Charlotte and Judith together. I remember Charlotte taught until she passed away at 102. Great picture. I think we have four generations here in this room. Maybe, maybe even five, but four at least. Judith has since studied and taught sensory awareness, natural breath, Tai Chi, and other forms of movement, meditation, Reiki-based work, gestalt, structural awareness, and pre- and perinatal therapy, developing her own deeply integrative way of working to meet the needs of different populations and ages that she works with. Here she is working with a baby. How could you resist? and another with an adult in perinatal processing, right, of those early, early states. After years of working with people in many parts of the world, Judith was encouraged to take a step back and look at what she had created when she was asked by a client, so what do you call this? Without hesitation, she answered, somatic reclaiming because it is not that we have to acquire something new, but that we need to come back into ourselves to rediscover, to reclaim our true natures. Says her colleague, Jennifer Burry, over these decades, Judith has worked relentlessly to follow her passions and create groundbreaking work, which has reintroduced countless numbers of people to their humanity and aliveness. Often, says Jennifer, Judith wasn't only the first woman to do what she was doing. She was the person, period. Says her friend, Britta Ostrom at Esalen, Judith has a remarkable ability to cut through regulations and make things work. If you know her, you know that's true. <laughs> she sees the implication and responds as a pioneer. How can we make this better? How can we make this work? Judith continued to travel the world, teaching in the US, Canada, Europe, Mexico, India, and Japan. Here she is again, back in Japan, sometime in the 1990s. Judith sent me these next two pictures. Here she is at one of the highest passes in Spiti Valley in the Himalayas in northern India. And at a somewhat lower village, but still above the tree line for the most part. In 1974, Judith was among the founding faculty of the Naropa Institute in Boulder, Colorado, creating its Dai Chi Chuan program. As I mentioned, she went on to be a core faculty member at the California Institute of Integral Studies, heading the East-West Psychology Program, while still managing to teach sensory awareness in Japan and raising two children as a single mother. This continued throughout the 80s and 90s when she started teaching Rosen Method and body-mind integrative work in Moscow, Russia. In 1995, Judith did volunteer clinical work for the Healing Center of Survivors of Political Torture connected to our somatics psychology program at CIS. 
There she worked with war survivors and Holocaust survivors. I love this. Another of Judith's deep contributions is her teaching of healing touch and other holistic healing modalities to the Tibetan Buddhist nuns at Dolma Ling Nunnery and the Institute of Higher Studies in Dharamsala, India, through the Tibetan Nuns Project. Her work included sensory awareness to help them get more in touch with themselves, she said, as most had escaped from Tibet and were fiercely traumatized. When I asked Judith how she'd begun doing this work, she said, I'd been donating money, sponsoring nuns. And in 1996, for the Tibet Freedom Concert in June in Golden Gate Park, some nuns were included as well as monks. This was the first time the nuns had been acknowledged. I invited them all to stay at my house in Mill Valley. This is pure Judith. <laughs> Been there, you feel right at home. What kind of tea would you like? Let's move on the deck. At that time, I met the woman who, this is Judith now. So the nuns are at her house and she says, at that time, I met the woman who founded and was director of the Tibetan Nun Project, the wife of the youngest brother of the Dalai Lama. When I asked her if there was anything else I could do, she said, well, I hear you do wonderful things with bodies. How about coming to Dharamsala and teaching the nuns massage? This is Judith. I thought, this is the weirdest request I've ever had. I almost became a nun, and I know they don't do massage. And I nodded my head up and down and said, yes, I'll come. Once there, she said, I taught 15 nuns for two weeks at a time. They knew how to take blood pressure, temperature, and so forth. And I wanted to help them learn to deal with situations in a holistic way without simply dispensing medications. And again, remember, these people were severely traumatized and barely made it out of Tibet with their lives, with very painful stories. So here we're reintroducing touch, among other ways of working holistically from what I would say is, is a master who's attuning to timing, prosody, all the things that Alan and Steve have been talking with us about. Judith has returned many times over the years to work with the Tibetan nuns teaching them and other interested lay people who started to show up so they could do the work for themselves and for their colleagues. Her work with them has been deeply healing and continues to this day as she's been told that they still do exercises she taught them 20 years ago. In 2016, 20 nuns became the first Tibetan women to receive their Geshe Ma degrees, the equivalent of a doctorate in Tibetan Buddhist philosophy. Previously, women had not been allowed. It took them 17 years of study and four years of exams, and they continue to do it. How many are there now? 37 now. As Judith says, this program, these graduations, this openness to the women, the nuns, would not have happened without His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and the Tibetan Nuns Project. So here she is congratulating one of the Tibetan nuns who was among the first Geshe Mas. And with one of the Tibetan nuns, she continues to sponsor at the Shugsep Nunnery. Here is a picture of Judith with His Holiness the Dalai Lama at his home. I think he serves tea too. No? Nothing? 
You'll tell us. Okay. Here the Dalai Lama is thanking Judith for her years and years of dedicated work with the Tibetan nuns. Here's a quote now from Tara Steppenberg, because you see I interviewed other friends of hers to see what they would say, as I said, because I knew Judith wouldn't say very much about herself. So I was. Tara Steppenberg is um, a friend of Judith's and mine, actually, a body-oriented psychotherapist, a Buddhist practitioner, and a movement specialist who's in an authentic movement with peer group with Judith in Seattle. Says Tara, what I deeply appreciate about Judith is that she walks her talk as a steward of people and the planet in every way, as an active lineage holder in several fields of somatic inquiry, and as a supporter of the Buddhist nuns and their academic education. Oop, did I go the wrong way? Oh. Okay. Okay. You might not know who this is. Reich's work is fundamental as one of the major influences. Maybe you do. So here we have Eva Reich outside of her home in, in Maine, and Judith visiting on a beautiful autumn day. Says Judith of Eva, some years later, in 1984, at a monthly meeting of Reichian practitioners in Berkeley, I met Eva Reich the daughter of Wilhelm Reich, the man whose work I had studied so deeply and to whom I felt we all owed a great debt. In our talks, she asked me what I did. I thought, uh-oh, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> because I knew that Reich never wanted his therapeutic work to be named after him. And in addition to that, I had integrated this other work and basically had changed it although surely I thought for the better, she said. I took a deep breath and told Eva that I had been trained and certified in Reikian therapy and that I had begun to integrate another kind of work into the basis of the therapeutic process. I told her that the work was called sensory awareness, that Charlotte Selver was my main teacher, and that her teacher in Europe had been Elsa Gindler. Then I gritted my teeth and held my breath, waiting for whatever would come from this dynamic woman who was on her eighth tour teaching around the world. I was surprised and encouraged when she exclaimed, oh, how wonderful. My father would be so happy. <laughs> we became great friends. I studied with her and was certified by her to do her work. She has stated several times that she does not think her father would have begun to work with the body, especially the breath, if he had not been influenced by the Gindler way through so many of her students. So here we have these rich rivers of cross-pollination, right, that we know about. Here's Judith at the James Turrell LACMA exhibit retrospective with Jennifer Burry when they were there for a Gestalt conference, another of Judith's disciplines, in November of 2013. This photograph brings to mind my own early meeting with Judith in which the fluidity, playfulness, and grace of her movement conveyed her inner spirit. Can you see that? Yeah. This was complemented by her direct, keen observations of human nature and the humor that made those possible. Here's Judith in her kitchen in her cabin in Cortez Island in British Columbia. There we have the parasympathetic nervous system. <laughs> Judith's development of body, mind, spiritual integration is based on the belief that, quote, we are born with what we need, but that traumas, teachings, and so forth confuse and deter us, and that with support and awareness, we can reclaim our natural inclinations and live the full lives that are our birthrights. 
Our colleague and friend, Dr. Marty Glenn, said of her years of collaboration with Judith, Judith was a big force in Santa Barbara Graduate Institute, offering the first PhD in somatic psychology. She knew exactly how to develop the curriculum. She made sure it was not only scholarly, but included personal experience. So here was top down and bottom up and straight from the heart. For many years, Judith traveled from the Bay Area to Santa Barbara every month to chair this program. And this is from Marty. She is a consummate presenter, teacher, and supervisor. And this from Jackie Carlton, founding, another wise woman, um, founding editor of our USA and International Body Psychotherapy Journal. And she says of Judith, Judith, for me, is a highlight of every conference. Both her workshop, which I faithfully attend and benefit from, and in the delicious dinners and conversations we share. I came to know her better during her dedicated work on the USABP journal honoring her mentor, Charlotte Selver, and am moved by her often humorous words about very wise things. It just kind of slips under your skin before you kind of know what's happened. Says Donalia Goltz, where are you, Don? There you are, whose granddaughter, delightful granddaughter you just saw. A former student of ours at SBGI, who now directs continuum work. This is how much I really like Judith. My husband and I bought the property next to hers on Cortez Island, <laughs> where we share food and time with our grandchildren. That's the real deal. Here she is. Heading to, oh, here she is on the deck at your house, right? Yeah, on the island. And here she is heading down to the beach below her cabin. Says her friend and colleague, Marianne Benson, embodying this essence of wisdom, the courage to face everything that it is to be human. This is Judith. May we all be infected with this wisdom. You know, I practiced this in my room and I wept. <laughs> so I'm glad I'm not doing that now. Judith has always been a huge lover of the wilderness, inner and outer, and of the ocean. Here's a view from her cabin on Cortez Island. On the beach, summer of 2013, doing Tai Chi on her deck. Practicing Tai Chi, you have this in your programs, on Cortez Island. And now this from her friend, Priya Huffman. Judith embodies an integrated approach in both her life and her teaching. She brings a focused attention to all that she does because she involves herself only with what matters most to her. As a Tai Chi teacher, she will not let us get away with any bad or sloppy form. Yet she is the first to giggle at both herself and us in all of our efforts to get it right. Here's Judith taking her grandchildren, another generation, Alice, 13, Celia, 11, and Griffin, 7, on a boat to Alaska. This is part of her adventuresomeness, and they have that. <laughs> a personal photo from Judith's home in Seattle. In closing, in speaking of how Judith was nominated to receive this Lifetime Achievement Award, Karen Roller wrote me about the conversations that she, Aileen, and Chris had had, saying, we wanted to bring attention to one who has never lost sight of wholeness of power with, not power over, of service, of sustaining through embodied relationship, and who continues to teach from loving presence. Judith also brings together, they said, she does, east and west, which is a necessary step in the right direction of a more inclusive 
and representational organization, things that you were talking about, Carmen. We want the next generation, said the, the committee, who is receiving this baton to stay focused on building these connections and relationships at every level. Despite all of this, Judith once told me, once told one of her students, that what she does is nothing special. She never fails to stay close to the earth and stay true to the humble person she is who walks her talk and lives her values. Here, a longtime student, Hiroki Yamaji, who is here with us from Japan. Where are you, Hiroki? Longtime student of Judas, who studied with us at CIIS and at SBGI. He says of Judith, Judith once said that what she does is nothing special. But without her guidance, I might not have been able to discover this nothing special. <laughs> Judith will be 80 next year, a dedicated mother and grandmother. She's a world traveler who's profoundly curious, devoted to healing work, consciousness, and deep well-being. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Judith Weaver, recipient of this year's Longtime Achievement Award. Could we turn that on? <laughs> or maybe go to another one? Or, oh, or, or, or one of the views from Cortez or something? <laughs> OK, this one? that one I can handle. <laughs> uh, thank you so very, very much. I am incredibly honored and still nonplussed. Um, thank you, Chris, Aileen, Karen, for all the work and for this conference. Thank you, Tina, for that amazing... Oh, would you do that for my children sometime? <laughs> <laughs> and Stephen, thank you so very, very much for your talk. I was sitting there going, ditto, ditto, I don't have to come up here at all, just keep on talking. <clears throat> and I think it's really wonderful that in your um, interview with Nancy, you did say, why am I you know, being awarded this? And when Karen first sent me, it was an email, I said, why? So I think it's great that the EA, that the USABB, excuse me, um, has two awardees who are still asking why. You know, we're still alive, we're questioning, great. Although, when I think of that, I also think of Fritz Pearls, who said, don't ask why. <laughs> ask how or what. So there we are, we're asking why. And whew, it's an utter honor to be here. It's terrifying to be up here. Um, but I'm realizing that some of you, we've been talking about um, Selver, Gindler, and it was a thrill for me yesterday to hear some other presenters even, even allude to Gindler and Pickler and everything. But some of you don't know, so I'd like to give you a little, a really quick rundown. Um, really, Elsa Gindler was... Uh, a woman who liked to move, who needed to move, and she had studied with uh, Heidi Kallmeyer way back in the 19th century, gymnastics, which in, I think a good translation, translation is beautiful movement. And um, she was poor, 
She worked during the day as an accountant and went to school at night. And at one point, she became very ill. And um, her doctor in Berlin said, well, you know, if you've got money, you can go to one of the spas up in Switzerland like everybody else's. And she said, I don't have any money. And he said, well, go home and prepare to die. So she went to her home home, to her family, and went to her family doctor. And the doctor agreed. She was very ill. I think by this time, one lung had collapsed. And he said, how did you do this to yourself? How did you do this to yourself? And she really took that. And she went home and paid attention. She sat quietly. She listened to her organism. Charlotte Silver says she was even able to rest one lung so that it healed and use the other one to live. She became a vegetarian. She did a lot of things to, to clean up her act and learned a lot about how. And a year later, when she was back in the saddle, you might say, she didn't want to teach people movement anymore. She wanted to help them find their own movements, to find their way. And this is how the work started. Um, over the years, she was asked many times what she called the work. And she would have a puzzled look on her face. And she said, I just work with the whole person. She never named her work. Um, she, some of you may have heard of Heinrich Jacobi, who was a, a musician, an experimental musician. They uh, collaborated a lot. They, were, they worked for, to the end of, of their lives. Uh, Feldenkrais worked with Jacobi. Uh, many, many people have worked with um, Gindler of all, of all uh, lines of life. And out of Gindler came Emmy Pickler, who was a pediatrician who, when she went back to uh, Budapest, her home, after the war, the, um, the government asked her to take the orphans and make an orphanage or something, just get the kids off the street, the ones that have lost their parents. And Emmy Pickler said, I'll do it if you let me do it my way. And the government probably said, just do it, do anything, we don't care. And the first thing she did was she fired all of the medical professionals. <laughs> and she brought in young women from the countryside and said, just be with these babies. Don't do anything for them that they don't need help with. You know, just be with them, be present with them. I think it was one person to one baby. And that was it. And the uh, pickler has died, Pickler's daughter took over, Anna Tortos has died, someone else is now. The Losi Institute is still going on. People come from all over the world to learn how to be, how to be with babies. Uh, Magda Gerber is one of the people and we had a presentation from that work ye um, yesterday and it was just so great to, to see that there are more people in that somewhat isolated field coming here to this somewhat isolated field for a long time, body psychotherapy. Even though many of you know that I have a very big fight with the term body, body psychotherapy, but I won't go into that. <laughs> oh, good. You know, I found in my notes a, 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 an editorial I wrote in 1979 saying, Let's not use this term anymore. 1979, you know, you know, what about somatics? And when the EABP started, and I've been to every conference from the beginning, I would say, why do we have to call it body psychotherapy? And the answer was, because the European Association calls it body psychotherapy. <laughs> really? And they're older and they're bigger. And that was the answer. Courtney, everybody. So maybe we can still do something, you think? Yeah. That, would be, that would be really something. And then, then the other comment is, but nobody knows what somatics is. And I said, great, there's an opportunity. 
we get to explain it, right? <laughs> Education. So Gindler died in 1961. She lived to a great old age, having paid attention. Charlotte Selver was her student, another gymnastic person. But after uh, Gindler, uh, Charlotte came to the United States in 1938 and eventually called her work Sensory Awareness. I first heard of, there was a class offered at the New School for Social Research in the 50s, nonverbal communication, and I thought, that's for me. I wanted to go, and it was Charlotte Selver and Charles Brooks, but it interfered with some of my dance classes. So I never went and didn't meet Charlotte until I came back from, from Asia. But Charlotte, uh, Charlotte, never used the term body. I studied with her for 35 years, and the only time she used the term body was to not say nice things about it. <laughs> you know, She would bring someone who insisted upon that dichotomy up to the class and say, OK, so where's your body? That's an easy one. OK, where's your mind? That's much harder. So Charlotte never used the term body. I don't think Gindler did either. She also didn't use the term mind. Um, and I just want to make a point that here are two women. Neither of them were psychotherapists. Well, with Elsa Gindler, psychotherapy was just being developed down the road in, in Berlin. But neither of them were psychotherapists. They were not really very educated people, except into something, an exercise that they really didn't want. And they have influenced so many many, many, many people around the world. Charlotte Selver had, uh, Charlotte Selver was, uh, was offered, gave the first experiential workshop at Esalen Institute in 1963. Uh, Alan Watts received a phone call one day. You all know who Alan Watts is. He's not a body psychotherapist or a somatic psychotherapist. But he got a phone call one day and someone said, I just met someone who does what you talk about. <laughs> he was one of the popularizers of Zen Buddhism to the West. So to his credit, he started studying with Charlotte. And he brought her to Esalen. And all of the, all of the influence that she had, and if I'm correct, all of the Life Achievement Awards from USAPB there has been one to a woman. All of the others have been to men. And that woman created her work with a combination of sensory awareness, Gestalt, and Alexander, Alana Rubenfeld. And that's been a while. So um, yeah, mm -hmm. synergy. Synergy was what she called it, Rubenfeld, Rubenfeld synergy. So Emmy Pickler and the children trained other people, Elfriede Hengstenberg and um, Uta Strub, and they are still going, well, Hengstenberg is also gone, but I, after the Congress, the EABP, I slept in the bed that Elfriede Hengstenberg gave Uta Strub when she died. <laughs> and my towel had her name on it. I was just like, wow. And there are little places in, in, your, in Berlin, anyway, where parents can bring their children and just, they sit against the wall and they just watch their children and everything is child proportioned and they get to play and do things that, uh, that you wouldn't let your child do because you would be afraid that they might fall or something. But these children are assured and they don't fall. It's really, really something. Um, one other thing that's really important from coming from the Gindler, Selver, uh, tradition is that we, I never call my work teaching. I offer the workshop. I, um, yeah, uh, our, the, the work we do, and that's a bad enough term, we've got to think of maybe the play we do, is not an exercise. I've never done the same thing this, again, you know, again. We call them experiments or explorations. And in fact, a lot of it just feels like child play. Child play without being interfered. But, and I really want to share that with you more today, so 
I uh, hope, hope to do it, and I'm going to, there will be a sign, yes, I, I want to. I want to just tell you a little bit, a few examples of how this work has, has really worked or been, uh, I've been impressed with it uh, throughout the world. And I remem I'm remembering that the first time I went to um, Russia, which was in 1993, shortly after the push, the, the fall of the Soviet Union, and I went uh, teaching Rosen Method many times, but I always, I base, base everything in sensory awareness. And it was so, so amazing to have these people. First of all, they were safe. They were in a room. We shut the door. And they were able to, to pay attention and the tears that just streamed down their face. I don't think they had had the time to pay attention to themselves or just sit quietly and breathe or be for a long while. And every time I went, they would ask me to do that again. It was so moving. <clears throat> I always felt that this work could um, end wars, but we have to end the wars in ourselves first before we can help other people end a war. And um, I had a unique experience in 1990, Hiroki-san just, just reminded me. Um, I had been teaching in Japan since every year since 1985, I think. And uh, 17 people came from Japan to take my workshop in sensory awareness. And I asked if we could just keep it open to multicultural, whomever wanted to come. And there were five Caucasians who walked in that night. And did we have a, we must have had a translator. You, were you the translator? Anyway, anyway. So we had this, this quite nice group. Uh, there was a German doctor from Munich, a Swiss a woman from Switzerland, and two women. One was a college student here in Santa Barbara, and the other one was a housewife. And they were a little bit miffed that they had not been informed, like I asked Esalen to please tell them that there would be a chunk of Japanese, and that didn't happen. So they were a little bit miffed, but we got over that. And I thought the workshop was going well, but there was still something not, not happening that, that was feeling right to me. Um, the German man was very quiet, uh, he spoke to the Swiss woman, and he, he participated in the workshops, but he really didn't say or do much else. And it was, I think, the third day we were paying attention, focusing on standing, just standing. And at one point, one of the Japanese men said, oh, gosh, I, I remember this posture. I was taught this way. In, in school, I have to have my heels together and my lo knees locked and my buttocks tight and my shoulders tight and my chest out and everything. And he said, and it really feels, and it really, you know, yeah, and it really feels terrible. And the other Japanese men said, oh yeah, that's really terrible. This is how we had to stand in school. And the German doctor broke out. He said, that's how I was taught to stand as a Hitlerjugend, as a Hitler youth. And they just, it was, I have chills. It was, yeah, Hiroki-san was there. Yeah, it was such a, a meeting. They looked at each other, they could talk to each other, they could share this uncomfortable teaching that they received and had to do. And boy, the end of the, the rest of the workshop was really easy. <laughs> it was wonderful. They talked, they cried, and they exchanged letters. I even got letters from the doctor after the workshop. It was really, really uh, a moving situation. Um, and then the, the clinic that Tina mentioned that we did at CIIS for, for victims of political torture, um, I remember one of the men who just could not, just could not let go. And he said he didn't want to. I mean, he didn't want to talk. He didn't want to anything. And what he said was, he said, you cannot know. I don't want you to know, you know the horrors he had been through. But through sensory awareness, we were able to meet him where he was, safe, 
quiet, settled, and the sensations in the present, which allowed him, which supported him and allowed him to live. Uh, and he had space for easier living. And I want to talk just a little bit more about the, the Tibetan nuns who have meant a lot to me, as you can imagine. Um, I went there the first time, it was 1977, and these nuns, they had walked over the Himalayas to escape. Many of them didn't make it, of course. And unfortunately, um, there were monasteries built for the men, but not for the women. So they were living by the side of the road until the Tibetan Nuns Project was developed. And we have done amazing things. And that was the Dalai Lama holding my hand, thanking me. He said, thank you, thank you so very much. And I'm going, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> anyway, the first time I went, all the different nunneries, they have little clinics. And the women know how to you know, take temperature and, and give aspirin. And when I worked with them, I very ignorantly felt that they could feel into themselves. Well, no, of course not. They'd been through hell. They were in prison. One of them had her head used as a football by the Chinese in a game. I mean, really incredible things. Um, but we developed some sense of, you know, of 10 days, two weeks, touch, not touch yet, but just safety, connection, and all of that. And then I was so surprised when we got to, because they were working with people, and I went to every nunnery and opened up a clinic, and people came in off the streets. So I wanted them to know how to work with people. So when we got to, just a touch, just on the shoulder or something, they couldn't feel themselves. They could only feel the other person. They could feel the toucher, but not themselves. So that took a while. And finally, they were able to stand differently and, and feel more about themselves and what they were doing in the world differently. And I went there maybe 11 times through the 10 years. And the last time I went, they said, you know, there are a lot of us that are growing old and dying. A lot of us have died terminally ill, will you please teach us more how to work with, with our elders, with our terminally ill people? And so I was thrilled. Another two weeks, and I taught them slow down, ask before you touch, or let them know at the very, very least. The prosody is very, very important. Pay attention to your voice give support, and in the middle of a word, I went to myself. I stopped and I thought, this is exactly what I teach new mothers, how to be with their infants. Uh, pregnant mothers, how they will be with their infants. And I thought, wow, coming in and going out, we really need the same things. We need that connection. We need that, that, that safety, everything. Thank you, Stephen. That's why I said I didn't even have to come up here. But wow, that safety, that connection. And it was just, it, for me, it was a full circle. Yeah. And I want to tell you one more quick um, case here in the United States because it, it stays with me so much and I'm concerned so much and I want all of you to really get involved with it. A nine-year-old boy was brought to me. And the father on the phone said that the, his son was addicted to screens. I'd never heard that term before. He was so addicted to screens that he just didn't do anything else. Nine years old. So much so that he also became very afraid of things. He was afraid of the dark. He wouldn't get up at night and go to the bathroom. So he started wetting his bed. His father then had to start sleeping in the bedroom with his son to wake him up, to get him out, but that wasn't very successful, and the father was really tired and really pissed. So he brought him to me, and, and this young, nine years old, had really lost himself. He had lost his body. And so we worked with touch. Not my touch, his touch. Yeah, I, I, it was just a first session. That was just too, too scary. And the father's touch. And um, 
It seemed that things were fine. He went home. A week later, I got a, a call from the father who said, things are a lot better. He doesn't make it to the bathroom, but he gets up and he tries. So he brought him back, and we worked on standing, on shifting weight, and having your eyes closed, because it's nighttime, it's dark, and just walking through the dark, and, and, and you're feeling your feet, all of that touch, and wow, I haven't heard from them, so I think it worked. But this is something I am so concerned with in our society, in our world. Maybe we can talk more about that later. So rather than tell you any more about, I would like to just share with you the experience. Is there a clock? Oh, there's a clock. OK. And I'm wondering, as you've been sitting here, and we've been sitting here for a couple of days now, and thank heavens the chairs are comfortable, I can say that. It could be a lot worse. Other than the person on fr up front or making your notes or whatever, I wonder what you've been aware of in yourself. And as soon as I say that, people start changing. Because as we become aware, we think, well, maybe that wasn't so comfortable. But how is it for you right now? You don't have to change it in sensory awareness and sensing that there's no wrongs. It just is, whatever it is. So how are you aware of yourself right now? What are you aware of? How do you sense your breath? And before I mention the word breath, were you aware of your breathing at all? And when I mentioned it, I wonder if anything changed. Do you have any sense, I mentioned good chairs, of the support that we're receiving right now? The back of the chair, the sitting in the chair, the floor underneath you. And can you really receive that support? Or are you still holding yourself up, maybe where you don't need to? Just notice. Again, there's nothing wrong. If we notice, if it doesn't feel quite right, we might want to change and then follow that. Where in you do you feel the movement of your breath? I asked that before. I wonder if it's different the second time. And if you will, if you can take one hand and just touch a spot where you feel the movement of your breath. And does that touch change anything? You know, everything matters. You might say everything is interesting. And now, if you let your hand come away, I wonder if anything has changed in you. Maybe your breathing, maybe how your hand feels, maybe something else. Maybe the weight in your chair or how you're sitting. I'm going to invite you to just come up to standing. There, I checked, there seem, I think there's enough room in between the rows of chairs. Just come up to standing.
And how is your breathing now? <coughs> is that place where you felt the breathing most, is it the same place or maybe it's different? Just notice. And the support now of the floor underneath your feet. How do you receive that? Or are you receiving that? Maybe you're holding yourself up a little bit. Maybe there's some little bit more that you can let go and let the earth, the floor, the earth support. Just, just feel it. I'm curious as to how the hand that touched your breathing, how that feels, and the other hand that didn't touch the breathing. How do your hands feel now? Are your hands breathing? And feeling your feet on the floor, the hand that didn't touch your breathing, can you take it up and just touch the very top of your head? The touch of the floor, the touch of your finger, the top of your head. Do you feel anything in between? How do you feel this distance between the bottom of your feet and the top of your head? And what's happening in this space for you now? And before your hand gets tired, let it come away. And how does your standing feel to you now? Need some water. And as we're standing here, I see a lot of you, I usually shift. I don't stand still. I don't think anything alive stands still. I don't think rocks are still, but anyway. Just as you might want to, as you feel um, ready and available, just allow your weight to shift from one leg to the other. And what do you notice? What's happening as your weight shifts from one leg to the other? Does anything happen in your breathing? Does anything happen in your hands as your weight shifts from one side to the other? And if you've had your eyes open, can you allow your eyes to close and just continue the shift? And if your eyes have been closed, allow them to open. And I wonder if that experience is different for you.
What differences might you notice? And can we all now shift eyes open or close, whichever feels best to you. Just stay with your weight on your right side. Where in you do you feel your breathing? Are there places where you're aware that there is no breathing? Just notice. You're feeling your weight from the top of your head down through into the bottom of your right foot. And then allowing yourself to come back to center. And noticing what happens. Maybe there have been changes in your hips, maybe in your knees, your shoulders. Maybe in your mouth. Let's take our weight and shift it onto your left leg now. And how is this standing on this side? Is it very different from the other side? Just noticing. Is your breathing different? And what do you feel from the top of your head through all the way down into the bottom of your left foot? Notice anything around your hips. Maybe your belly, <coughs> your thighs, your breathing. And now coming back to center, weight on both legs, however it is, equal, not equal. Just how does your standing feel now? Okay. I would love to hear some responses, and I think there are some mics around. There's supposed to be a microphone. Is there anyone? Thank you. Is there anyone who would like to say anything? And sit or stand as you prefer. Is there anyone who would like to say anything about your experience? Mm -hmm. It's coming to you, I hope. Okay. Hi, I'm Joelle. Um, I'm a first year at CIA Somatic Psychology oh, program, really? so very Great. wonderful to hear you. Um, for me, I think particularly before we moved over to the right, there was just a lot of heaviness in my shoulders in particular as I was coming hmm. into sensory awareness. And it's just something I can't shake, a lot of ancestral movement that wasn't allowed that I'm witnessing allowing through me. So it made me very emotional um, to feel that and to know that there's 
hope of breakthrough, of sort of remembering the yeah. body, particularly with yeah. um, colonization. And remembering, like, yes. Remembering the Coming body. back to, there's hope. I don't know about the breakthrough. It might come slowly. Right, at okay. least in my body, yeah. I'm saying specifically. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? About anything you'd like to share about your experience? Hmm? I can't see. I guess the thing that um, you know, is most vivid for me is that when I pay attention to myself and I come to the standing, and then I feel this huge lump of pain in here. And, you know, I feel like listening to you talk and just being here generally has kind of, you know, increased my awareness of that and talk about the Tibetan nuns and so forth and so on, you know. And it's, it's my personal pain and it's also my resonance to the pain generally. Mm. And it's, it's really hard for me to kind of stay present to that, you know. I do, but it's like a constant source of, of discomfort. It's a, it's a challenge. It is a challenge. I agree with you, yes. Yes. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much. My name is Eddie. I'm a body worker. Um, so I have uh, several subdiaphragmatic surgeries, um, especially one uh, more recently. Uh, so I'm reminded through this movement that the pandiculation is really the, the stretching and the, the activity that my body needs to recognize the lower half. Mm. Um, and, and just very slow, mindful, like, actual movement, like putting the body in motion is, is it's not something that uh, I get access to every day. So that's what I was reminded of, so thank you. Thank you. And, but we have access to us every day, you know? So that's a great, great question. Why don't we have access to it every day? Why, why can't we pay attention a little bit every day? Hey, stop. <laughs> Hi, Judith. <laughs> This has been so wonderful. I have so much enjoyed, as you know, I st also studied with Charlotte and also Magda Proskauer, yes, who was yes, also a student of Elsa's. Yes. And this is just a, oh, is there another mic? Oh, <laughs> I'll get a little closer to you. It's just such a wonderful reminder to hear your voice and to be directed by you into the body and into just sensitively coming into standing, coming into the shift from one foot to the other, touching oneself. It's so peaceful. It's so beautiful. It's so wonderful to be with you. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Except I'm going to make a correction. I did not direct you into your body. I directed you into yourself. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I want to say, I, there are others, I just want to say so I don't forget how, um, how much we do every day and how busy we are and who's going to remember that. I mean, Hiroki-san's from Japan. He's, years and years and years ago, I said, if you don't have time to do anything when you're washing your face, just pay attention. You, know, you can do it when you're eating your bread, anytime. It doesn't have to take other time out of our lives. We can just be more real. Who wanted to? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Good afternoon, Judith. Good afternoon. Nice to see you. Thank you. You too. I'm terrified of speaking in front of people. Me too. <laughs> so I'm actually, a, I have my master's degree in speech and language pathology. Mm-hmm. Closer? So I think I might hold, I might be the only person holding that professional degree here, which is exciting because in my profession, as Dr. Poor just mentioned, my degree is in communication disorders and sciences, speech and language pathology. And yet, I have not, I'm sure they're out there, met another speech pathologist who, who is saying, what about the nonverbal? Mm. Um, so, back to my body. My one-year-old son is at the hotel that I'm staying at. Sorry. My hips, uh, my one-year-old son is at the hotel. And um, my delivery of my son was at home, and it was lovely. And I was fierce. So fierce that my husband has probably been traumatized. This is our second child. And I had knowings of the delivery of our daughter. I said, this is where, how, what, sort of thing. And then with my son, I said, well, it'll be at home, it'll be in the bathroom, and I will squat as the position. Mm -hmm. I said, but I haven't seen anyone else there. And my husband said, well, what do you mean? I said, I don't know. I just didn't see in the, in the dream, in the vision, if there was anyone else there. That sent panic through my family. Because, so I had midwives on call, but they, they knew that my other premonitions were pretty darn valid. So they were worried that I would be by myself. And I said, well, I'm not saying there won't be anyone. I just can't verify that there will be. <laughs> um, so it scared everyone, and I just said, look, but I'm fine, the baby comes out fine, it'll be a boy, it'll be fine. At any rate, that was an initiation for myself with my family um, in the sense of me knowing and trusting, but to share it with ex people who I love very much, my husband and my mother, you know, my family, and have them be afraid. Be culturally, women haven't necessarily embraced their fierce knowing in a long time. Um, so, my hips, after 12 hours of squatting, because the baby was posterior, <coughs> so his head was facing, his spine was against mine. Um, basically, I had to open, and to flex my tailbone out. And that position, it'll take a while for my pelvic floor to come back mm -hmm. into yeah. Yeah. a position that's balanced. So the swaying back and forth mm -hmm, today mm -hmm. is really intense mm -hmm. because the right side is up and high mm -hmm. and the left side, anyway, mm -hmm. um, one side is tighter than the other. And mm -hmm. So I'm going to um, just, I'm going to take the microphone from you because I want, whoops, good. I, what I'd like you to do is to put your hands on there and, and sway and even stand in the back and continue to do it, okay? Great. Yeah, and just as much as you want, but this could really be valuable. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to, am I still working? I think I saw some other hands, but I'm also, and I'm also looking at the clock. So let me uh, offer you something more, and then hopefully we'll have some more time. Um, I wanted to make sure I did this, Stephen, because of what you said about the eyes. We just spent a, almost, well, a half a week in Japan in the workshop we worked on. We didn't work on eyes. We paid attention to eyes and, and hopefully tried to get them to not work so much. So just, just tuning in and paying attention to um, how your eyes feel. We've all been looking a lot at other people, at other things, beautiful sunsets, beautiful things. 
I feel a great difference in the quality of looking and seeing. And looking to me seems like an awful lot of hard work and narrowing. And it, when I can be in myself and allow the seeing, everything is much, much more open. So may I suggest that we just um, take a breath and allow our eyes to close again. And you notice I don't say close your eyes. There's the use of words is also very important. So allow your eyelids to close. And feeling your breathing. Feeling again your sitting, your support. Can you feel your eyelids that have gone over your eyeballs to close? Are they able to rest? There might be some jerking or, or twitches. Is there any way they can come to rest? And even though your eyelids are closed, your eyes might still be looking, trying to look. Is there some way that your eyeballs can rest? This may sound funny, but see how it feels. And if you can rest behind your eyelids, your mouth will probably want to start resting also. Can your tongue be soft? And your jaw be just where it needs to be, not having to hold it any place special. Do you have any sense of the roof of your mouth? And might there be any possibility of softening there. And if you would like to allow your jaw to just fall open, Just allowing whatever that feels right to you. Whether your breath comes in and out through your mouth or your nose, whatever is most comfortable to you right now. And maybe you can soften the area around your ears. If there's any tension or intention there, can that, can your ears also just be? And then, with your eyelids still closed, can you take the palms of your hands and put your palms over your eyes? Not to touch your eyes, but just covering them like a cup. And this may also bring a little awareness of the muscles around our eyes, around our forehead and cheeks, if there's anything that might want to change, loosen, relax there. So soft hands over your eyes. And 
Letting your breath come in and out on its own. Giving up any intention of looking, doing, just sitting here or standing here right now. Can your shoulders and upper arms be loose enough so that your hands can easily meet and cover your eyes? Any yawns that might want to come are perfectly acceptable, welcome. Sounds might want to come out from your throat also. Yes, mm -hmm. sighs, groans, whatever wants to come. <sighs> and then because we do have a time limitation, keeping your hands over your eyes, can you very slowly allow your eyelids to open? So they will open behind your eyes in the darkness. And maybe your eyes can get a sense of being open and not having to look out to do anything strong. Can you just allow your eyes to be? Feeling the blinking even behind your, your palms. And then, and feeling the softness of the muscles around your eyes, your forehead, that whole circle around your eyes. And then when you're ready, very slowly allow your hands to come away from your eyes. And turning your head, not to look, but just turning your head to see whatever wants to come into you. Is that possible without having to strain to go out? Can we be here and allow the world to come to us? Sure, sometimes we really have to go out and and do, but can we also be, can we also receive? How is your breathing now? And how does your sitting feel? Right here, right now. Okay. I think I've got a five minute sign, but if there's anyone who would like to say anything, uh, I'd be very interested. There's a mic. There's someone here. I was aware, interestingly, or surprisingly to me, of the things that when you directed my awareness to some aspect, you know, my eyes or my looking, how much pull I had from something else. Like, for example, as I was tending to my eyes, my neck felt like it needed to, mm. you know, like I had to pu you know, push again some sort of movement there. And then as I noticed, as I focused on my inner first initial, I stopped breathing. Mm -hmm. And then when I would come out, I mm -hmm. would start breathing more comfortably again. So just the sort of peripheral other things yes. that grabbed my attention as I was yes. invited to. Yes, shift my we are you. all connected. Yes, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Right here. Mm -hmm. uh, that was lovely. And I'm, as a, as a somatic therapist, I'm aware of how much when we're drawn into the body, how much that evokes. And I'm wondering what, you know, 
you would say about how we work with that back and forth or what, you're, um, what you'd say about that? About <laughs> what it evokes? Well, just a lot of times now, I love working with the body and going mm -hmm. internal. Mm -hmm. And you know how much comes up from going towards the body or into the body. Yeah. And so I'm just mm -hmm. how you yeah. might yeah. how we work how you work with that when that when that happens. I can say very quickly that I've been, been told to stop that um, I find that working at this level releases so many of the other things that could get messed up. There's a lot less, tr I mean, transference. The person is really in touch with themselves. They don't have to put a lot of things on me. You know? uh, all sorts of, when somebody says, I say, what are you feeling? And they say, I'm feeling anger. I go, OK, so what does that feel like? You know, We get down to, into so many deeper layers because we can stay in touch with it. That's my 22nd answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 <laughs>